Hello, hello, and welcome back to another Ravelox project. This time, we have hardware, we have software, we've got 3D printing, we've got everything. Let's go. Back in 2014, I bought my first Raspberry Pi, and I needed a project to make use of it. I had the great idea of interfacing a cheap drum kit that I had in the garage collecting cobwebs and trying to send that information from the Raspberry Pi to Logic Pro to record some music. I spent a lot of time researching how to get that information across to Logic Pro and I found that Apple uses something called Apple MIDI, which is also known as RTP MIDI. So I ended up writing a proxy from the Raspberry Pi to anything that would listen to RTP MIDI. Now in 2018, the project has its own GitHub repository and I'll put a link to that in the description below. It gives me a great buzz to find that there are people that are actually using it. Recently I came across a YouTube video by Angus from Maker's Muse who made his own MIDI controller using an Arduino and some arcade buttons. I thought this project would be great to adapt to my software and I had a Raspberry Pi 0W which meant that I could make the project wireless. In a previous project I created a remote control for my Roomba using shift registers to detect button presses and also to light LEDs so I knew that this project was going to be something that I would be able to do. So here it is, my version of a MIDI controller using shift registers and Ravelox MIDI. A shift register is a useful way to be able to handle more inputs and outputs than there are control pins on a microcontroller. In the case of a Raspberry Pi, there are a lot of GPIO pins to use, but in general, a shift register provides a lot of flexibility. I'm using a 74HC595 shift register for both the input and display handling on my MIDI controller. Other shift registers are available, but this one has 8 pins for regular output, plus a 9th pin for daisy chaining shift registers together. I'm not going to cover daisy chaining in this project, but using that 9th pin lets us control many more inputs and outputs. The principles of this type of shift register are common to most of the others. The shift register holds 8 bits of data with an input side and an output side. There's a clock pin, which is made high each time data is input. When that pin goes high, two things happen. Firstly, each bit of data in the input side is shifted one position, so you can see how it got its name. What this means is that bit 1 is moved to bit 2, bit 2 to bit 3, 3 to 4, and so on. The 8th bit is moved to the ninth position, where it effectively drops off the end of the world. Secondly, the data on the serial pin is copied to bit 1 on the input side. If the serial pin is high, that represents a 1, and if the pin is low, that represents a 0. The latch pin is used to signal that the data on the input side should be moved to the output side. This is done by toggling the latch pin high. I should say here that this doesn't output the data yet. This is where the enable pin comes in. That's normally high, but when the pin is taken low, the data from the output side is sent to the output pins themselves. And finally, there's a clear pin to reset everything. So, let's show how this works. Firstly, the clear pin can be optionally used to reset. Then, for each pulse of the clock, the data is read from the serial pin and the internal bits are shifted each time. Let's say we've entered 8 bits and we want to output that data. At that point, we can set the latch pin high to copy the input to the output and also set the enable pin low to send the output to the pins. So now that we understand the basics of the shift registers, how can we apply this to buttons and LEDs? Well, first of all, let's start with the LEDs because they're the most simple. Here we have the shift register with the clock, serial and latch pins. The difference here is that the enable pin is permanently low so that whenever we toggle the latch pin, the data is output immediately. This is just for convenience, it makes no sense using up another pin just to set enable. On each of the output pins, we attach an LED with a current limiting resistor going to ground. The process for lighting the LEDs is as follows. The latch pin is set low because we don't want to output the data until all the bits have been set. For each LED, the clock pin is pulsed and that data is read from the serial pin. Again, when the serial pin is high that represents a 1 and low represents a 0. When all the values for each LED have been set, the latch pin is set to high and the output pins will light the appropriate LEDs. And that was the theory, let's look at it in practice. And for that I'm going to need to do a split screen showing the circuit that I built plus a terminal window onto the Raspberry Pi. First of all let me show you the Raspberry Pi. This is a Raspberry Pi 0W, which means that it's wireless, 
I'm only using the USB cable for power. Now I've broken out some of the pins to a breadboard here and you can see that there is the shift register. This is a 74HC595 and then I've got an array of LEDs. There's eight LEDs with a current limiting resistor here that's going to ground. So what I'll do now is I'll show you how I get that interfaced with the Raspberry Pi. So here we are on the Raspberry Pi and this is the script that I've written to light some LEDs. The first thing we need to do is to indicate which pins are going to be used for the shift register and you can see here that I've set the values for each of those pins that I'm going to use. You should note that I'm using the Broadcom numbering scheme. You'll find references to that on the Raspberry Pi website. The next step is to indicate that each of those pins needs to be an output pin. The first real step we take is to clear the shift register and we do that by setting the latch pin to low, toggling the clear pin off and on and then turning the latch pin back up to high again and this will send zeros out to all the output pins. The next step is to read a value from the command line that we're going to use and this is a single integer. So taking the value that we read in we're then going to output that through the shift register. So the first thing that we have to do here is set the latch pin low because we don't want to see the result until we're finished. And then for each of the bits in an 8-bit byte, we're going to work out which ones need to be on or off. And then on the serial pin, we'll set that bit. And then send the clock high and low. And that will clock one bit onto the shift register with everything else shifted down. And as I say, we loop through that for each of the bits in the byte. Once all that's complete, we can set the latch pin high again, which will output the data. So let's see how we can do that with the shift register. So here's the shift register, and we're going to run this script using the value, let's say, 55. So when I hit return, it's going to go through all those steps and light the binary representation of 55 onto the LEDs. Now note here that what you're seeing is kind of a reverse, so the least significant byte is on the left, the most significant byte is on the right. And I can change this to be different values as I go along. Let's light them all. Let's do another number. So that follows the basic principles of the shift register and this is going to be useful for us indicating which button has been pressed. So that's the practical application of lighting LEDs. Let's move on to buttons. The principle for detecting button presses is slightly different from lighting LEDs in that we're only ever going to test one pin at a time. So in this diagram here we have an example of three buttons that are connected to the shift register and each of those buttons is in a normally open state, meaning they're not connected. Now because we are going to ground, we also need to have a diode connected to each button to prevent any of the other pins from causing a short circuit. Using the shift register, we'll send each of the output pins high and then test the GPIO pin that's connected to the output. If that GPIO pin is high, that means the button at that corresponding pin has been pressed. If it's low, it means it hasn't. We complete going through each of the pins, and once we have that, we'll have an integer that represents which of the buttons has been pressed. So the process for this is as follows. The first thing is we'll set the serial pin high, and then we take the latch low, and then toggle the clock, and that puts the high bit that was on the serial pin into position 1. And then we set the latch high to transfer from the input side to the output side. And you can see again in this diagram, output enable is low, which means that the output will immediately be available once we set the latch high. So that sets the first pin on the output high, and we'll test to see whether the GPIO pin is high. Then we set the serial pin to be low, and that means that what follows on from that is always going to be a zero. So we're only ever going to be testing one pin because what we'll do then is we set the latch low, we clock that bit, and then we set the latch high. So what you'll see is effectively a one that goes from pin one to pin two, pin two to pin three, and so on. But everything else will be low. So we're only ever sending one of those output pins high. 
and at each time we're going to test the GPIO pin. So hopefully that seems pretty straightforward. So again, let's look at this in practice. And here's the button circuit. The shift register is here. We've got the pins from the Raspberry Pi that have been broken out, connected to the shift register. And then we have three buttons, just for illustration, with a diode connected to each one. Now I've made this top rail the data output, so we have a pin that's going from this data output back into the Raspberry Pi. The thing to point out here is that I'm using the 3.3 volt output from the Raspberry Pi for this part of the circuit. The reason for that is while the LED part of the circuit is output only, the LEDs with the current limiting resistor are tolerant of 5 volts. Because with the button part of the circuit we're going to use an input back into the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi GPIO pins can only handle 3.3 volts for input. So this is why we have to use that for power. Just be aware of that when you're wiring the circuit up. So with that circuit in place, let's go and look at the Raspberry Pi script that uses this. And here's the script that we use to detect the button presses. It's slightly different from the LED script in a couple of places. The first one is that we designate one of the pins to detect the button press itself. And while everything was marked as an output pin in the previous script, that button pin itself is marked as an input pin because we're going to read that data. Now again what we do, the first thing is to reset the shift register itself because we don't want to detect button presses erroneously. So we'll start from the start. The next thing is just purely cosmetic for this script to give the person using the script the chance to press a button. And this counts down from 5 to 0. And when that's done, we follow the process that we documented in that diagram. The first thing we do is to set the serial pin. And then for each of the buttons, we clock the, that serial pin. And then test the GPIO input pin to see whether it's high or not. And if it's high, then we'll add that value to a total. And this is binary notation, so the first pin will be 1, second pin will be 2, third pin will be 4, 8, 16, etc. And once we've done that, we set the serial pin to 0, which means that the next time we clock the data, the pin will be set to 0, and then the next pin will be set to high as it shifts along. And we keep going through the number of buttons that we have. And when we finally finished, then we output the value. So let's look at that in practice. So here's the button circuit again, and then on the Raspberry Pi, I'm going to run the button script that we have. And I'm going to press the middle button, and we'll be able to see what value comes up when that button's pressed. So it gives us the countdown. I have my finger pressed on the button, and you can see that the button value is 2. Now let's run that again and I'll press the third button this time. And with that third button pressed the button value that we get back is 4. So what happens if we press two buttons at the same time? I'll press the first and the third button and the value should be 5. And there you have it. This is a working shift register circuit detecting button presses. So now we're going to combine both of them together. And here's both parts of the circuit together. I've rewritten my Python scripts so that they're easier to implement into projects and I have a class for the LEDs and a class for the buttons. So here's the script and simply all this does is loop through detecting the button press and then outputting which buttons have been pressed as LED values. So let's see that in action. So all I'm doing on the Raspberry Pi is running the script and that's going to give me a chance to detect the buttons. And what I have there is a countdown so that I can press the last button that's available. This is just a way of being able to shortcut having to go through more than the number of buttons that are available.
but as you can see there are three buttons that it found. Now on the LEDs you can see that none of those are lit right now but as I press a button the appropriate LED lights up. Pressing button one, pressing button three and pressing one and two together. So there you have it. The circuit works. The Raspberry Pi is detecting that information correctly. So let's look at how we can get this into a MIDI controller. And this is what it looks like. So I have arcade buttons connected to a panel. And each of these arcade buttons has a switch unit and clipped onto the top of that is an LED unit. So they, they form one single piece and then that fits into the arcade button itself. I'm using spade connectors purely for flexibility. So here we have the Raspberry Pi and then just underneath there I've got a couple of shift registers, one for the LEDs and one for the button presses themselves. Hopefully you can see that each of the arcade buttons has four wires going to it. Two are for the switch and two are for lighting up the LED. So let's run that script again and you'll be able to see what it looks like from the front. So we're back on the Raspberry Pi and if I run the script again it's going to give me a chance to press the last button in the list and then you'll be able to see it working from the front. So this detected eight buttons. So if I press any of the buttons at random, they should light up. And I can press more than one at once. I 3D printed an enclosure for this. So I'll put that together and then you'll be able to see this running as a MIDI controller. And here's the assembled enclosure. I added some ventilation in case there were problems with the Raspberry Pi heating up. And this box is actually quite big. It's more of a constraint because of the size of the arcade buttons. Depending on what kind of arcade button you get, you may already have the LED and switch unit integrated into the button itself. But because those were external for the buttons that I had, that dictated how tall that the box needed to be to provide some clearance for the pins and also for the Raspberry Pi. But your mileage may vary. So let's look at this in action. And now the enclosure has been assembled, let's run the software. And the first thing is to run the proxy that I wrote. So we'll run this in the background. And what you can see over here is this is now available on the Mac as a RTP MIDI or Apple MIDI connection. So we're going to connect to that. And we've got the connection. So the next thing to do is to run the script for the MIDI controller itself. And this is going to give time to detect the number of buttons that are available in the same way as the previous script did. And what I've done is I've configured this script so that it sends the MIDI notes for specific parts of a drum kit. And this is the drum kit configured in Logic. So let's press three of those buttons. And you can see the script is indicating that it has detected a button and it's sending the kick note. And you can see on Logic that that kick note is being registered. The same for snare and the same for the tom. And we can send multiple instruments at the same time. Now with the right configuration you can configure all eight of those buttons and they will light up. So the script sends those notes as MIDI events through Ravelox MIDI to Logic. And that means everything's working as it should do.
And there we go, that's the end of another Ravelox project. I'm really pleased with the way this turned out. I was able to go from first principles through breadboarding to soldering a circuit and then printing a 3D enclosure that was usable and that made me really happy. If you've got any questions then put them in the comments below. I'm going to try and make as many of the files as I can available as quickly as I can. But if you like what you saw then please subscribe. If you didn't please comment and tell me why. Otherwise I'll see you for the next Ravelox project.